Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Lord, we thank you, Father, as we, this morning, Lord, we look into your word. Lord, we welcome your Holy Spirit in this place this morning, Lord. Teach us, Lord, your thoughts. Lord, give us your life. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We live in a country where we are guaranteed an inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And you can find many books in any Christian bookstore about how to have a better life. And what we would call seeker-friendly churches have a gospel of how to have your best life now. How you can live a very successful life and have a, a wonderful life. So when we get into the parts of the gospel, that is knowing this, that your old man, that our old man is crucified with Christ, and teaching the death of the old man and teaching how to die, that God's prescription for us is death. That's what's going to fix what's wrong with us. Whatever is wrong with me can be fixed if I just die. It's a little hard to give that perspective when you're surrounded by all the reasons you can have a wonderful life, a successful life, how to get rich, how to win friends and influence people, and how to do all of these things. And now, you're going to tell people you need to die. I'll never forget hearing Pastor Schauer teach when I was at Eurocom. And he was saying that he was teaching something along this line, but he was talking about after service one night at a meeting he was doing, that a grieving mother, an older lady came up to him and she was grieving and she was, she was in tears and crying. And she said, I lost my 17 year old daughter. And she said, and I've been crying ever since. I've been grieving ever since. And he was struck with compassion for the lady. And he was trying to comfort her. And he goes, well, ma'am, how long ago did you leave your daughter? And she goes, it was 25 years ago. And he was like, wow. You know, he's like, ma'am, you know, this is not God's will for you. That you would be in this state 25 years later. Not to minimize the terrible loss that she went through. We would never naturally recover from something like this. But the only way that we recover from the wounds and the bruises in our soul. God prescribes for us death. And I think about in the Exodus. Where Moses struck the rock and water poured forth that what a beautiful picture that is of death that from the death of jesus christ that the water of life flowed forth and there is a similarity there's a parallel for us to draw from this and of course watch my knee his book, The Release of the Spirit, shares some of this with us. But I was thinking of 2 Corinthians 4 because I think that this gives us a view in there. And then I'll share what Watchman Nee has to say. But 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 4, verses 6 and 7. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in his heart shine in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power of God of the power may be of God and not of us. And I'm thinking, what does this really mean? We have this treasure of earthen vessels. And can you imagine can you imagine with me that you have a rock here, a rock that's this big, 
And you know that in the center of that rock is this valuable diamond, but it's inside encased in this rock that's about the size of a dinosaur egg. I've never seen a dinosaur egg, but, <laughs> but I'm imagining here, okay? Because we're imagining the rock too. But you have this rock with this valuable diamond that's inside of it. How are you going to get that diamond out? And just think about that, because I'm not going to tell you how to get that out. But how do you get the diamond out of the rock? Because the rock is valueless, right? The rock has no value. You can find them all over the place. Just come to my yard and I'll show you. You can find more rocks than what you know what to do with. But the diamond is something that's precious and valuable. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, something that is of infinite value, that's inside of something <clears throat> that is dead and has little or no value. The importance of being able to get this treasure out is this, is that sooner or later, every Christian comes to this realization, and it's this. And if you haven't come to this realization yet, you will. Is that the greatest frustration in my Christian life is me. I am my biggest problem. Sooner or later, we're going to realize that this outer man doesn't match what this treasure within is. It doesn't match the inner man. And the inner man, my inner man may head one direction, and my outer man does exactly the opposite. And the Apostle Paul voiced his frustration at this. And he says that the things that I want to do, I find myself not doing them. The things that I don't want to do, I do these things. Oh, wretched man that I am. And he's seeing that there's a treasure on the inside. But what's on the outside is not reflecting that. So Watchman Nee writes about the inner and outer man. He defines them. And we went through this last week. So this is going to be old school to most of you. But human beings were created by God with a spirit, soul, and body. Genesis 1.27, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 speaks of this. It has been said that we are not bodies with souls, but we are souls that have bodies. We have this, we're souls that have bodies. The body, the outer man, is our physical housing through which we experience the world. Our bodies function primarily through the five senses and by meeting innate needs that drive us to eat, drink, sleep. Our bodies are not evil. And the reason he says this is because... And there's still some holdover from this is Gnosticism that taught that all matter is evil and we were just innately evil. That, that is not true. It's like our bodies are not evil, but they're gifts from God. He desires that we surrender those bodies as living sacrifices to him. Romans 12, 1 and 2. When we accept God's gift of salvation through Christ, our bodies become temples of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, and 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Our souls are the personality centers of our beings from which our mind, will, emotions operate. With our souls, we choose either to listen to and obey the lust of our flesh and the unregenerated man. Your soul will always agree with your body. It will never agree with God until you are born again but your souls with our souls we choose to either listen to and obey the lust of our flesh or the desires of the holy spirit galatians 5 16 and 17 romans 8 9 mark 14 38 the soul of a person is the courtroom where life decisions are made it is the seat of the self-life and the fountain from which character traits such as self-confidence, self-pity, self-seeking, self-affirmation, all of this originates 
in the soul. And now finally the spirits, our spirits. Our spirits contain the inner man about which the scriptures speak. Our spirits are where the spirit of God communes with us. Jesus said, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. It is within our spirits that we are born again. The inner man contains the conscience upon which the Holy Spirit can move and convict of sin. Our spirits are the parts of us most like God with an innate knowledge, an innate knowledge of right and wrong. For who knows a person's thoughts except this own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. No one knows, and, and think of that, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. That brings us back to what Chris has been teaching in Isaiah 28, 9, and 10, right? To whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine, right? Those who are weaned from the milk, drawn from the breast. For doctrine must be what? It must be precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. It's revealed by God. It's only given by God. The thoughts of God taught when our spirit communes with him. Here's some scriptures that divide the man into inner and outer man. And I believe that this is where people make the, the error that man is bipartite instead of tripartite. There's three parts, spirit, soul, and body. But there are two ways in which we relate with the inner man and the outer man. Romans 7, 22, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. After my spirit, I delight in the law of God. Ephesians 3.16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. In the inner man. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, outward man, our body, is going to perish. Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And we're going to see now the importance of the breaking of the outer man. It is important that the outer man is broken. That our old man is crucified with Christ to release this treasure that is in this earthen vessel. So you think, well, why don't we all just kill ourselves and be done with it, right? And in a sense, not literally, but in a sense we are doing that as in humility we submit to the will of God. And our priorities and the order of our life completely changes where the inner man, the spirit, is in control. And the soul and then the outer man the soul and the spirit fall into subjection. God resides in the inner man. And the man outside this God-occupied inner man is the outer man. We have an inner man and we have an outer man. Our inner man delights in the law of God. But outside the inner man is our mind, our emotion, our will. And outside of that is our body, which is our flesh. And when the Bible refers to the flesh, it is typically referring to the mind and the body both, the parts of us that relates to the outside world. In order to be, re to be used of God, the inner man must be released. And in order for the inner man to be released, there must be a breaking of the outer man. I'll never forget, I think it was our first year at convention. 
when Dr. Wright stood up and spoke, and he's been to our Christmas banquets a couple of times, and he's, a, he's a, just a terrific man of God. But he used this illustration. He took and he held up a sheet of paper, and I'm not going to throw this paper because I may need it. <laughs> but he held up a sheet of paper, and he said, this paper represents your natural life. And he threw the piece of paper like this, and it hardly went anywhere. It fell somewhere down in front of the pulpit. But then he took it and he crumbled it into a ball. And he said, this represents the breaking of the outer man. And he threw the paper. And of course, it went halfway down the aisle. And he said, you see, without the breaking of the outer man, we can't be used of God. And we get absolutely nowhere. We fall flat, just as the uncrumpled paper. God has to dismantle the outer man in order to make way for the inner man. I was just trying to think just off the top of my head of a couple instances when God broke the outer man. Anybody ever hear of Jonah? Did, did he get broken? I would say three days in the belly of a fish. That would, that would do it. And, it, and it did it for him. How about Nebuchadnezzar, who was very prideful? He had to go out and eat grass for, for years. But death and the bearing of fruit are so closely tied that John in John's Gospel, chapter 12, he uses this illustration. John 12, 24. Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bring forth much fruit. And I always think of the illustrations that we used to hear of the person that is hungry and you've got this little bag of corn or this little bag of wheat and you can grind this up and you can make a loaf of bread and you can eat for a day. But if you take that wheat and you plant it, that in time you have a tremendous harvest from this wheat because the death brings forth abundant life. The life is in the grain. However, there is a shell on the outside of the grain. And it's a very powerful shell. And as long as that shell doesn't break open, there's not going to be any growth from the grain. But as moisture softens that shell, and in time, the shell will crack and break, and then when it breaks, new life springs forth. John 12, 25, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hath his life in this world shall keep it unto life. Or he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. According to the Lord, the outer shell is our own life. That's the thing that is holding the new life in. It's what they call the bios life, is the life of my body, my life of my flesh, or the suke life, which is the life of my soul, my mind. But the life that is inside of me, the life of Christ that springs forth, the Zoe life, that springs forth that my natural life must be secondary. There's two conditions for those that are born again. And we could be bound as a Christian, as a born again Christian. I can be bound, I can be surrounded by the shell, and I could be locked up and have that treasure locked inside, never letting it come out. But I could be the type of Christian that is opened up. That though I am broken, 
that the life springs forth. There is a need for the breaking. And in John 12, 3, and in Mark 14, 3, and I'll read it from Mark. Mark 14, 3, and being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, Jesus sat at meat. There came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, very expensive. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. And it's strange how, naturally speaking, we have such an appreciation for the alabaster box. We have such an appreciation and put such value on the container that we forget that the flask is nothing more than to hold the ointment. And it is the ointment that is precious, not the flask. Many times we think that our outer man is more precious than our inner man. We can treasure wisdom and education. How smart I am. How smart this person is. I can treasure my emotions that are from my soul and make those the most important thing that it can be of utmost importance to me to experience pleasure. And there have been different classes of people and different philosophies that have clung to this belief. The Epicureans believe that it is paramount to experience pleasure. That is the paramount thing. That is what life is about, to experience pleasure. Some treasure themselves, how eloquent they are, the abilities that they have, maybe physical abilities. But we're not antique collectors that collect antique flask. We're after the ointment. We are the people who are after the aroma of the ointment. And that's why the Holy Spirit's working in us to break the outer man. And we may face one trial after another. One unpleasant thing after the other. But in the end, if we submit to this, that the aroma will come forth. The timing of breaking, how do I know how long it's going to take to be broken? Or how God will do it? It's different for everyone. He may break us in one of two ways. It may be a sudden way where an event happens that makes me un to understand, that works in me, that makes me understand that this life is so temporal, this outer man is so weak. Or it could be a cumulative thing where it lasts for years. And it's why I thought that it was a good example to use the two biblical examples there is because how long did it take to break Jonah? Three days, right? How long was it for Nebuchadnezzar? Years. Say, yeah, seven years, I think. Years of eating grass as an animal. And we see it's different for everyone. But the Lord will work in us. He's doing a complete breaking of our outer man if we will only, if we will only submit to that. It's the work of the cross. It is the meaning of the cross. As we see that it was the cross where Jesus' life was given for our sins, that his body was broken on the cross. It's the meaning of the cross. There's a couple reasons why we will not be, why someone may not be broken. And one is, is that they will not submit to it. They believe that it's too harsh. And they always see that it's someone persecuting them. Or that I have just have bad luck. How many believe in bad luck? <laughs> but God is breaking us. He's doing a work. 
But another thing is I can love myself too much. And I remember someone saying one to me one time, and I was just thinking of this yesterday. You know, I, he said, I know the Lord is calling me to do this certain thing, but I am not going to put my family through the financial hardship of what it would take for me to do what I feel that the Lord is calling me to do. It's refusing to be broken. We can expect that there will be wounds in this life. But what happens as this aroma comes forth, we become very pliable in the hands of God. Where we're like the clay in the potter's hands and he can form us and shake us, shape us into the vessel that we are to be. We are pliable. What are the characteristics of someone who is pliable? The manifestations. We become easy to deal with. We become someone in the body of Christ that edifies. Someone that people would want to come and to talk to and maybe share things with. We can be sensitive to the sufferings of others because our outer man is broken and that spirit is released. It's easy to give and to receive edification when you've been broken. And you may think, that's crazy. Who could not receive edification? Have you ever met someone that you try to edify them and they're like, oh, no, you know, it's, it's not me, you know. Or you try to do something for them. Like, no, 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 you don't need to do that. I don't want to feel like I owe you anything. And they cannot, they are not broken in that, that pride keeps them from receiving or from giving. Edification is when our spirit touches God's spirit. So what can we expect? There's no limitation on the breaking of the outer man. Different for everyone. But we know it's not just that people are picking on us or that we're having bad luck. But God desires to see his life flow through us. What's the song that we sing in that scripture? I've got a river of life flowing out of me that when this old man is cracked and broken and tattered, that it's then that that river can spring forth from us.